sir, you already have the list of questions with you. I would request you to take over and uh, please address devotees' queries. Namurat. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Uh, is, my, is my sound loud enough? Absolutely, sir. Yes. Uh, so, sometimes my sound is a little bit muted. Um, I've received a list of questions. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's very nice to be back. Um, I was sent a preliminary list of questions. And then a couple of days ago, one extra question arrived by email. And I thought, ah, that's, that's something that really interests me. I'm going to start off by answering that one, and I might spend quite a lot of time on it. So the, the first question I want to take up reads, in Upadesha Manjari, uh, Upadesha Manjari is spiritual instruction, the question and answer work that appears in collected works. Sadhu Natnananda writes in chapter two that self-inquiry is only suitable for right souls. Others have to practice other methods like stuti, japa, etc. So that was the statement. The actual question is, how does one know whether he or she is ripe or not? Uh, this is a very in interesting question and it has lots of uh, facets or aspects to it. Um, when, when I saw the formulation of this question, I was immediately reminded that this question, almost verbatim, appears in Sri Ramana Gita. So I've done a bit of homework this time round. I'm going to read out quotes from time to time. So I'll read out the quote that uh, the question that appears in Ramana Gita, and it says, question, who is considered fit for this inquiry? Can one by oneself know one's own fitness? To which Bhagavan replies, he whose mind has been purified through upasana worship and other means, or by merit acquired in past lives, who perceives the imperfections of the body and sense objects and feels utter distaste whenever his mind has to function among sense objects, and who realizes that the body is impermanent, he is said to be a fit person for self-inquiry. By these two signs, that is, by a sense of the transitoriness of the body and by non-attachment to sense objects, one's own fitness for self-inquiry can be known. So Bhagavan is saying, yes, one can do a bit of self-evaluation, but look, look at the slight difference between what Sadhu Natnananda says. Um, he is saying that people have to practice other methods like stuti, japa, and so on. Whereas when Bhagavan is asked the same question uh, and the answer appeared in Ramana Gita, he doesn't say practice. He says that you need to have a sense of the transitoriness of the body, non-attachment to sense objects. It's more a question of attitude. If you feel that the world, yourself, are impermanent, if you feel a dis distaste or a disgust for what's going on in the world and you want to transcend the world, then in Bhagavan's opinion, you're fit to practice self-inquiry and to go immediately into it without going through other practices such as Stuti Japa. So that's the reply he gave in Ramana Gita. Now, Ramana Gita has, how shall we say, a, can a canonical version. There's the version which the ashram has published, which has appeared through many editions and many translations. But uh, there's, a, there's another version which is more recent and it's one, it's a rewriting of the text by B.B. Narasimha Swami, who was Bhagavan's first biographer. And when, when he got to work on this text, uh, he added something to this uh, question, which I found, found to be a little bit suspect. So I'll read, I'll read out Narasimha Swami's uh, expansion of this particular question. Um, the question in his version comes, can anyone judge for himself if he has the necessary competency for self-inquiry. To which Bhagavan allegedly said, this is an important preliminary question. Before Atma Vichara is started, some antecedent experience, some achievement in the moral field is essential. Um, I have to say where this text came from. When I was um, going through all the archives at Raman Ashram in 1980, somewhere Nine, maybe 80, 81, I found a huge uh, cache of papers which B.B. Narasimha Swami had left at Ramanashram when he took off around 1930. 
one of his unfinished projects was a rewriting of Sri Ramana Gita. Uh, it was never published. I'm not sure. I think it was intended for publication, but somehow he left without doing anything. I looked at this and I thought, no, this isn't quite right. Um, years later, I showed it to Venkata Subramanian, my co-translator on many projects. And he said, absolutely no way. Bhagavan ne never said anything like this on any other occasion. He never said that you have to have some moral attainment in the moral field in order to begin self-inquiry. And that was my feeling. I thought, no, this can't be true. So fortunately, um, I must have found this before 1980, because I remember I showed it to Viswanatha Swami, who passed away in 1979. He at that time was the editor of The Mountain Path. Uh, he had been a devotee of Ganapati Muni as well as Bhagavan. He had translated Ramana Gita into English. He was actively involved with the text on many, many occasions. So I thought since he knew Ganapati Muni, since he knew Bhagavan well, he, he was the person to take this version to. So I took it to him and showed it to him. And I, I could see he didn't like it. He, he was frowning all the way through. And his conclusion more or less mirrored my own uh, after he'd gone through it. He was a very polite man. He, he was uh, not someone who would uh, react overtly in a negative way. So in this very polite way, he said, this is not the way that Bhagavan dealt with devotees. Um, these dialogues, they creep forward, establishing points one by one, each new point depending on the arguments that have previously been presented, including Bhagavan never beat about the bush. He, he didn't develop his arguments in the way a lawyer did or in the kind of Socratic dialogue method. He went straight, straight to the point. He put his finger on the most important part of the argument, the question, and answered it directly. Then he looked again, he said, there's a lot of uh, extra material here. There's a lot of comment extrapolation, which doesn't find a place in the original text. Bhagavan, he said, Bhagavan went through this text many times in Sanskrit. He helped with some of the translations. I, I know for a fact, uh, K.K. Nambiar said he helped him do the Malayalam translation. Viswanatha said he helped with English translations. This one had to say, we, we can trust the original version because we know Bhagavan went through it word by word. We have no idea where all this extra material came from. And we have no reason, reasonable reason to believe that this is what actually happened in the original conversations. And then he said, I don't think Narasimha Swami had any contact with the people who asked these questions. And some of the things that he has Bhagavan saying here don't sound very authentic to me. So after that extremely negative review, I concurred with Viswanatha Swami, I deferred to him, and I, I put, the, put the manuscript back in the cupboard where it stayed for several decades until someone with uh, perhaps not Viswanatha Swami's uh, knowledge of what was going on decided it should be published. So I'm, I'm just giving a little... Uh, Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware on this one. I don't think Narasimha Swami's version is one that stands up. I think we should stick to the original text that was published in Bhagavan's time. So what the, the bottom line of that particular digression is, I don't think you need to have or need to cultivate any moral virtues or succeed in them in order to begin self-inquiry. What Bhagavan says in Ramana Gita is that you need a sense of discrimination, a sense of disgust towards the world, um, a desire to transcend it. And at that point, you don't need any preliminary practices. You can just sit down and start your practice of self-inquiry. Bhagavan um, not only never taught, that one should, through one's deeds, bring about a level of good character and dharma, which would then equip one to practice self-inquiry. In fact, he said the opposite was true. He said that if you practice self-inquiry, that's the best way to establish good qualities in oneself. So it's not that virtues lead towards a level or a level of morality or dharma, which gives you a head start on inquiry. He said it's the other way around. If you practice inquiry properly, 
then all those virtues accumulate inside you. So I, I will just read a quote that appears in Day by Day with Bhagavan, I think, yes. And it says, it is no doubt said in some books that one should cultivate one quality after another and then thus prepare for ultimate moksha. But for those who follow the jnana or vicharamaga, the path of self-inquiry, their sadhana is itself quite enough for acquiring, acquiring all divers divine qualities. They need not do anything else. That's from day by day. And a very similar reply can be found in the preliminary dialogues of Satdarshana Basha. And there the questioner asks Bhagavan or makes a statement, when one is a sufficiently developed soul, Pavki, he becomes naturally convinced that the real self, so this is Bhagavan speaking, when one is sufficiently developed, he becomes naturally convinced that the real self awaits inside. And the question is, how is this development possible? To which Bhagavan replies, various answers are given, but whatever the previous development, Vichara quickens the development. So here Bhagavan is saying in both of these quotes that the practice of inquiry in and of itself uh, increases the virtues, increases the Dharma. You don't need to add up your Dharmas, add up your virtues until you've got a big enough heap to start practicing. The practice of inquiry in and of itself will do that job for you. Now, it, it's clear that Bhagavan does on several occasions indicate that there are some people who are ready to do inquiry and some people are not. It's worth looking at and examining, examining some of his other statements on this topic to get uh, a clear idea of who he thought could benefit from inquiry and who should take up the other practices. That's the, the essence of the original question. Who is suitable for inquiry? Who is right for it? And who needs to undertake other practices? So I'll, I'll go back to day by day. This, this is quite a, a long citation, but it's a very important one that Devaraji Medalia recorded in 1946. So he says, this afternoon, a visitor asked Bhagavan, no doubt the method taught by Bhagavan is direct, but it is so difficult. In other methods, there is something preliminary and positive with which one can begin and then go step by step. But in Bhagavan's method, there is no such thing. And to seek the self at once, though direct, is very difficult. To which Bhagavan replies, you yourself concede it is the direct method. It is the direct and easy method. When going after other things alien to us is so easy, how can it be difficult for one to go to one's own self? But then he makes some concessions to the, the people who want to do other practices and he continues, but the fact remains that to some, this method will seem difficult and will not appeal. That is why so many different methods have been taught. Each of them will appeal to some as best and easiest. That is according to their pavka or fitness. But to some, nothing except the vichara marga will appeal. They will ask, you want me to know or see this or that, but who is the knower, the seer? Whatever other method may be chosen, there will always be a doer. That cannot, that cannot be escaped. Who is that doer must be found out. Till then, the sadhana cannot be ended. So eventually, all must come to find out who am I. You are complaining that there is nothing preliminary or positive to start with. You have the eye to start with. You know you exist always, whereas the body does not always exist, for example, in sleep. Sleep reveals that you exist even without a body. We identify the eye with the body. We regard the self as having a body and as having limits. Hence, all our trouble. All that we have to do is give up identifying ourselves with the body, with forms and limits, and then we shall know ourselves as the self that we always are. Ah, now, in that particular long section, Bhagavan was invited to suggest preliminary exercises or practices that would lead up to self inquiry. At the beginning of his answer, he rejected completely the suggestion, pointing out that the true starting place should be the I or the I thought. However, um, although he recommended this method with enthusiasm to a devotee who didn't on the basis of this dialogue or my reading of it seem very keen on it, he also admitted that not everyone has a natural affinity with the technique of self-inquiry. In this um, day by day 
exposition by Bhagavan, he doesn't specifically mention the Ramana Gita qualifications at all about uh, having discussed for the world, developing detachment and so on. All he says is that those who are uh, temperamentally inclined, I think that's the best phrase, towards vichara can and should practice it, whereas those who are not should take to other methods. The bottom line here for me, and I, I think this is my conclusion after reading all these texts, is that if you want to do inquiry and feel good about it as a productive and viable method, then you're qualified to follow this practice. You, you don't need to start with something else and you don't need to convince yourself that you're unfit to practice. If, if you think this is the method for me, I trust Bhagavan. I believe Bhagavan when he says this is the most direct method, I want to do this. Then all that particular attitude that you have about the practice, the faith you have in Bhagavan, those make you qualified to start doing the practice. So I'll now read a little section from talks, which is also uh, supportive of these arguments. Bhagavan is saying there, if however the aspirant is not temperamentally suited to the chara, he must practice bhakti, devotion to an ideal, maybe to God, guru, humanity in general, ethical laws, or even the idea of beauty. When one of these takes possession of the individual, other attachments grow weaker, dispassion, vairagya develops. Attachment for the ideal simultaneously grows and finally holds the field. Thus, ekagrata concentration grows simultaneously and imperceptibly with or without visions and direct aids. In the absence of inquiring devotion, the natural sedative of pranayama, breath regulation, may be tried. This is known as yoga marga. If an aspirant be unsuited temperamentally for the first two methods and circumstantially on account of age for the third method, he must try the karma yoga doing good deeds, for example, social service. His nobler instincts become more evident and he derives impersonal pleasure. His smaller self is less assertive and has a chance of expanding its good side. The man becomes duly equipped for one of the three aforesaid paths. His intuition may also develop directly by this single method. Now contrast this with the traditional ways of doing things. In many spiritual traditions, I would say most of them, beginners are given preliminary practices, exercises, uh, and don't move on to the supposedly more advanced ones until they've demonstrated that they have done the first one successfully. But as, as the preceding quotation from talks indicates, Bhagavan didn't follow this approach. He asked almost everyone to start with self-inquiry and only if you complained that you didn't feel it was right for you or it wasn't suitable, then you would recommend other methods. So if you complained you weren't getting the hang of it or you weren't attracted to it, it was left to you to decide what you wanted to do or whether or not you wanted to continue with the inquiry as Bhagavan had suggested. So that there is one very important um, sentence I'm going to say now. I, I hope it doesn't get lost in all these quotes and possibly contradictory statements and sentences. Bhagavan never ever told a single devotee that he or she was unfit to practice this method. So there are a couple of citations. This one from Upadasha Manjuri is one uh, written down in the early years of Bhagavan's teaching career in which he did say that self-inquiry was for ripe souls or mature souls only. Um, he didn't specifically say what ripeness was, or he, he didn't specifically say you had to do exercises to become ripe. He didn't say you had to have a moral base to be ready for it. He said, if you want to do it, you have my blessing, go ahead and do it. And in my opinion, the only qualification you need to do self-inquiry is a passion to do it and a passion to succeed. Um, so let's go back to the original question for a moment. Uh, the question says, self-inquiry is only for right souls. Other, have, other people have to practice methods such as scooty, japa, and so on. Um, I've talked about this to some devotees, and they point to Upadesha Saram, Upadesha Uniya, excuse me, uh, saying that there's a a graded hierarchy of practices that Bhagavan recommends in that text. 
And I tell them to, to look closely at the text because at no point is he saying that you start from one, you master that one, you go on to the next one, you master that, and so on. Uh, he does start with low level, if that's the right word, practices, and move up to higher level practices. But if, if you look at what he's actually saying, it's quite clear that he's simply giving them ratings. He's giving them scores, if you like, on how effective they are. And he's not saying that you have to do one, and when you're good at it, you have to go to the other. So the key, ver the key verses are around um, seven, eight, and nine of Upadesha Undiyar. And he says things like, better than singing uh, stotras, hymns of praise is repeating Japa, the name. And it's better to do it in a, a, a very low voice than say it out loud. Um, better than that still is to meditate with the mind. Um, better, better than having sporadic or intermittent bouts of meditation, it's better to have meditation in a continuous current with no breaks, steady as a stream, he compares it to a flow of oil, and so on and so on. So he's not uh, in this text saying, start at the bottom of this ladder, do your japa, and then progress on, onwards and upwards. He's simply saying to a group of sadhus in a forest, uh, if you want my opinion, method A is superior to method B and so on. But in all his teaching career, he never said start with method A, go on to method B, method C and so on. He always said or always offered people the possibility of starting at the top, starting with self-inquiry. And if they were hesitant, if they felt something else made them happy, peaceful, quiet, he'd say, fine, carry on. Um, you asked me what the best method was. I told you if you want to do something else, then do something else. Now, there's a, a wonderful story that I first came across in uh, the pictorial souvenir that came out uh, to commemorate Bhagavan's birth centenary, centenary around 1980. It was narrated by Kanchi Swami. And the background, since Ganapati Muni is involved in the story, he's in the hall. I'm guessing it took place sometime in the 1920s since Ganapati Muni left Tiruvannamalai in 1929 and never came back. So Ganapati Muni was uh, present in the hall when a group of local villagers arrived, uh, went up to Bhagavan and said, how are we to control the mind? That's of course everybody's question. And by way of a reply, Bhagavan asked them to look into the origin of the mind he explained the path of self-inquiry, advised them to take it up. Um, they pronounced, they left the hall, and soon after that, Bhagavan went out for one of his regular walks. Ganapati Muni, who'd been sitting listening to all this, turned to someone nearby and said, uh, the path of self-knowledge which Bhagavan teaches is difficult e even for the educated, even for the learned. I think he meant himself. He never, he never really took to self-inquiry. Bhagavan is advocating it today to all these uh, villagers who come. I don't think they properly understood it, and I don't even know if they can practice it properly. I think it might have been better that Bhagavan had advised them to do pujas or japa. That would have been more practical and feasible for people in that situation. So this takes us back to the original question. Does one need to practice japa in order to prepare oneself for inquiry? Quite, quite clearly, Bhagavan didn't think so in this particular instance. These um, spiritually uneducated villagers came to see him, asked him how to control the mind. Bhagavan gave him his number one piece of advice and said, do, do self-inquiry. And Ganapati Muni demurred and said, I don't think they have the capacity to do it. When Bhagavan came back into the hall, somebody must have excuse me, passed on Ganapati Muni's comment to Bhagavan. And he sighed and he said, well, what can I do? This, this is what I know. This is what I know works. So when people ask me this question, I, I tell them what I know from direct experience actually works. He said that there's, there's a traditional way of teaching, and I don't do that traditional way. He said in, in that traditional way, the guru first has a look at the prospective devotee, disciple, uh, decides if they're qualified or not. Uh, if he thinks they're qualified, then he says, okay, do some japa, do some meditation. 
It's a progressive step-by-step -step process. And then after some time when the devotee has demonstrated competence, then he goes up to the guru and the guru says, Bhagavan says, oh, Brahman alone is real. Um, the, the, the directive path of self-inquiry, you can now start on that. And then Bhagavan says, that's not my method. What, why do we have this roundabout process? Why, why should I not state the ultimate truth and the direct path right at the beginning, rather than advocating all these uh, indirect methods, because sooner or later you have to reject them all. This is what Bhagavan said. He said, all these other practices, you can do them. They might give you some mental stability, but sooner or later you have to discard them in favor of self-inquiry or surrender. And Bhagavan said, you can do that on day one. You don't have to do all these other things. You don't have to attain maturity. You don't have to attain stillness of mind mastery to start inquiry. Just start off on day one, sit down, ask yourself, who am I? And forget about all these other methods. Um, oh, now, yes, I uh, had a little email exchange with Michael James today. Um, it, it went through a third party, and I happened to mention that I was going to speak tonight to uh, devotees from the Delhi Kendra. Um, I also mentioned that one of the questions I was going to address was this one from Upadesha Manjari, in which Sadhu Natnananda had written that you had to do stotras, japa, and so on as a preliminary exercise to self inquiry. So, about three or four hours ago, Michael emailed me and said, Oh, that, that always bothered me as well. So, I actually went to see Natnananda to ask him about this. So, we're back to uh, probably 1976. We, we both arrived in Tiruvannamalai the same year. I actually was Sadhu Natnananda's neighbor uh, for the last few years of his life. I lived in uh, the Osborne compound. He lived in the compound next door. Michael went there with Sadhu on to talk to him. And Michael was bothered by this same question which appeared in Upadesha Manjari. And he asked Sadhu Natnananda why or what were the circumstances in which Bhagavan advocated these additional practices as preliminary things you had to go through in order to be ready to do self-inquiry. Michael said he remembers Nathananda getting very animated in his answer. I think it was, it was something maybe he regrets putting in, in, in the book. And Michael said he said something to the effect that um, don't have any doubts. Anyone who is attracted to the practice of self-inquiry that Bhagavan has taught us has sufficient avka, sufficient fitness or readiness. All the other practices that Bhagavan referred to are only for those who are not attracted to this practice. So for them, all these other practices have to be handed out. So this is, again, essentially what Bhagavan himself was saying in the quotes I read out from day by day in talks. Natanananda then, interestingly, he went on to explain to Michael that at the time he asked these particular questions, he was having doubts about his own fitness as to whether he should follow the path of self-inquiry. Uh, this is interesting. I, I, I didn't realize the context of this particular question until today, until Michael sent me this information. So he felt at the time that he wasn't uh, totally convinced that he was ready for self-inquiry. And I, I think he put these other practices in as possible options, but he said as he went through them with Bhagavan, Bhagavan pointed out their limitations one by one, and then Bhagavan more or less said, well, which path, which approach appeals to you directly? And Natnananda replied that he felt very much attracted to the path of, uh, path of self-inquiry at Mubachara, and then Bhagavan said, then this is alone the path to which you are suited. This is what you have to do. So this, this again backs up a lot of what I've been saying, that Bhagavan would uh, listen to your counter arguments. He'd listen to your um, stories that maybe you weren't ready, that you wanted to do something else. But in Natnananda's case, he, he discussed the options with him. And having ascertained that Natnananda was quite clearly inclined to do self-inquiry. He said, this is your practice. This is what you should do. 
uh, go ahead and do it. And somehow I think this was recorded, not quite the way that uh, Bhagavan told Natnananda. It came out that some people need to practice these uh, recitations, these japas, as a preliminary to self-inquiry. I think Natnananda on this occasion wasn't saying that to Michael. He was saying this was just a personal conversation I had with Bhagavan in which Bhagavan went through all the possibilities that could be done, um, demonstrated that Atma Vichara was the most direct. And then after that, he directly asked me what appeals to you the most. Uh, and when he said Atma Vichara, he said, that's your path, follow that path. That there is, um, I talked a little bit about verses from Upadesha, Saram Upadesha Undiyar. There is a, a very, very important verse later in the text after he's given the hierarchy of all the practices. Um, before I give it, I'll, I'll give the preliminary ones. In, in verse 18, uh, we, we're on the section which deals with self-inquiry by now. Having gone through all the... Um, the lower, the lower grade practices, if you like, Bhagavan turns his attention to self-inquiry and says, mind is only thought. Of all thoughts, the thought I is alone the root thought. What we call mind is only I. And then he goes on in the next verse to say, when, when you look internally and ask yourself, what is the rising place of this I? The I will die. This is jnana vichara, this is self-inquiry. So that's how he defines self-inquiry in Upadesha Undiya. But then the really important answer or the really important statement for this particular little talk that I'm into is verse 17, where Bhagavan says, when one studies the nature of the mind without forgetfulness, one discovers there is no such thing as mind. That's classic self-inquiry. And he concludes the verse by saying, this is the direct path for all. So when Bhagavan wrote, this is the direct path for all, he was indicating that the practice was available to everyone and that everyone could profitably take up the practice. So having, having walked around this subject, approached it from several directions, my advice based on what Bhagavan himself said to anyone who thinks they're not ready for it, uh, or fit to start it is don't avoid starting it thinking that you have to take up some other practice thinking it will get you ready for self-inquiry um, if you want to be a good violinist you pick up a violin and you keep practicing on that instrument until you get good at it you don't pick up a clarinet and hope that after a few months or years of playing that will make you a better violinist that's not the way it works the only thing that prepares you to do self-inquiry well is to start doing it badly and then very slowly you get better and better at it until it becomes more automatic and more natural and don't let um, any feelings of in inadequacy prevent you from starting it. It's the direct path and as Bhagavan said, it's the one that everyone should follow if that's what they really want to do. So that's question one. Next question. Lost it. Ah. Did Bhagavan ever say that a faithful devotee can attain self-realization even when he has never met his guru in physical form? Or did he say that a physical guru is necessary? Another good question. Um, I'll start speeding up now. Don't want to run out of time. Bhagavan was asked about this on several occasions. Uh, primarily because he himself never had a physical guru. Uh, generally, when he replied, he said that a guru is necessary. I don't know any recorded quote when he said a guru was not necessary, but he never insisted that the guru needed to be in a human form. He couldn't really do that because his own guru hadn't been in a human form. He did say it was necessary, but he didn't say it had to take a human form. On a few occasions, uh, he cited the story of Dattatraya and his 24 gurus, a very entertaining story. Dattatraya, who was a sage, who according to Bhagavan, attained jnana through having uh, a wide variety of very uh, unobvious gurus, the five elements, 
the sun, the moon, various animals, the pigeon, the python, the moth, the beetle, the bee, an elephant, um, various people he encountered during his life, a honey gatherer, a courtesan, a child, an archer, and, and so on. Total of 24, he learned something from all of them, and the cumulative effect of all of these teachers and all of these lessons was, was that he realized the self. So I think Bhagavan cited this as a possibility that in certain circumstances, uh, a normal guru, a normal one-on-one -on -one guru relationship with a physical guru wasn't absolutely essential. There is one occasion where uh, somebody mentioned that Bhagavan didn't have a physical guru. And rather interestingly, he said, I must have had one at some time or other. I think the implication of that is he was referring to another life. He obviously didn't have one in his final life. In some of his poetry and his verses, he wrote, it was the power of Arunachala that brought about his own realization. And he also wrote, Arunachala is the guru. He never said my guru. He said Arunachala is the guru, implying that Arunachala could perform this function for other people as well. So I think Bhagavan, um, in conceding that he didn't have a physical guru, he said once he must have had one in some other life. And in his final life, he, he was willing to say that Arunachala could serve as the guru because it had the power to do the work, the business that gurus had to do. Bhagavan always taught that the guru is the self within. He's not the form that you see on a sofa or anywhere else. He said this inner guru is always available to those who turn their attention towards him. He did say, though, that most people uh, can't be immediately aware of the formless inner self, so they have to focus on the form of the physical teacher or practice his teachings. And he said both of those alternative routes would ultimately take one to the true guru who is the inner self. So yes, a guru is necessary, but according to Bhagavan, he doesn't have to take a physical human form, but at some point you all have to come to the inner guru and it's that inner guru that destroys your residual sense of I and makes you one with him. Uh, next question. Is absence of thought the same as holding onto the I? In the process of self-inquiry, one is to remove all the thoughts that arise. That creates a thoughtless state. Is that the same as holding onto the I thought? If yes, then is this Manolaya? Um, some statements here, which I'm not going to agree with. So I, I'll, I'll break down the question into its component parts and go through them one by one. Um, the first one was, is the absence of thought the same as holding onto the I? To which I would say, no, it isn't. An absence of thought uh, may be a consequence of self-inquiry, but it's not the inquiry itself. In self-inquiry, you're being asked to put your full attention on the entity inside yourself that thinks your thoughts, perceives your perceptions. At the same time, you're asked not to pay any attention to any thoughts and perceptions that distract you from this vigilant focus on the eye. If you notice an absence of thoughts, then someone has noticed that absence. So don't just think to yourself, oh, I'm thought free, that's great, that's wonderful. Be aware of the one who's registering the absence. You can be thought free and not have a witness to the thought free state, that's fine. If you're not having the thought, oh, that's great, I'm in silence, then there isn't a witness or an observer of the silence, you're just silent. But if you've noticed a state in which you're not having any thoughts, you've somehow brought your eye back into existence to register the fact that you don't have thoughts and you're being quiet and peaceful. So inquiry is not passively dwelling in a thought-free state. It is instead an intense focus on the entity that thinks the thoughts. If your state of mind seems to be a relatively quiet one, note that that state of quietness is an object of your attention and be aware of the one who's thinking, I have a quiet mind. In the next part of the question, in the process of self-inquiry, one is to remove all the thoughts that arise. Again, I'm going to disagree with this. Uh, that, that's not the process 
Uh, thoughts are not the problem. The problem is the one who thinks them. You don't aim to remove thoughts in self-inquiry. You first frame them, identify them as objects seen by a subject. Then you withdraw attention from them and you put it instead on the I which is thinking them. So self-inquiry is not a practice that suppresses thoughts or removes them. It treats thoughts as observed objects and then moves attention away from those observed objects back to the observer of them. Uh, and then there's another portion of the question which says, that creates a thoughtless state. Is this the same as holding on to the I thought? If yes, then is this Manalaya? Um, I've already answered the question about the thoughtless state. I'll just focus instead on the term Manalaya that appears at the end of the question. In Bhagavan's teachings and the explanations he gave, Manalaya is seen as an undesirable state. It's a kind of, it's a state of torpor, semi-consciousness that is essentially dull and tomasic. Um, it appears to be thought free, but it lacks the radiant clarity of the sattvic thought free state. People who are in it might think they are having a good time because they're not being disturbed by thoughts, but it, it, it's a kind of, it's almost like a semi anesthetized state, according to Bhagavan. It's not doing you any good. You're not making any progress in this state. And you can, he said, be stuck in it for quite a long time. Uh, there are a couple of incidents in the Ramanashram literature of Bhagavan spotting devotees who had fallen into this Manalaya. I think uh, Kunji Swami has recorded one. So he talked about an incident of a devotee who went into Manalaya in the old hall. Uh, Bhagavan spotted it and asked someone there to take the person outside. Um, and said, take him for a walk, make, make him walk up and down outside, get, get him out of these states. And he added that people can stay in these states for long periods, believe that they're great states, um, but they're not, he said they're not conducive to progress. I think this is one reason why uh, he said that inquiry or being aware of the self was something that could and should be done in the midst of worldly activities. If you can do your inquiry while the body is active, there's no danger of falling into these soporific states of Manalaya. Um, next question. Is there a daily routine that a seeker should follow? Did Bhagavan prescribe any? Um, again, I'll, I'll give a fairly brief answer to this because the answer is no, no he didn't. Um, I don't think he ever gave out prescribed routines because that wasn't his style. He, he wasn't prescriptive. He didn't tell people what they should or shouldn't do. In a general kind of way, he said, um, put your attention on your family and work at the times when, you need, when they need your attention. At other times, try as much as possible to keep your attention on the self or do whatever spiritual practice one has an affinity with. Um, he didn't like to tell people how to live their lives. Uh, I, I will throw in one extra Kanji Swami um, story. When Kanji Swami went to Palakotu, he was all gung-ho to meditate and do self-inquiry all day. And like everybody else, he, he discovered it, it's not possible. You can't sit and do self-inquiry all day. And he said in, in the periods when uh, he found that his mind wasn't cooperate, cooperating, he said, I do some... Uh, um, Parayana, I do some chanting, I read a good spiritual book. And when the mind was a bit more amenable to the process, he'd go back to self inquiry. And he told this to Bhagavan. Bhagavan said, Yes, excellent. Um, no, nobody can do inquiry all day. The, the mind is too resistant. But the important thing is once you've discovered that you can't do the inquiry properly, don't, don't give up find something else useful or productive to do with your mind, read a good spiritual book, do some japa, just, just don't give up. You, you can't keep up the intensity of inquiry all the time, but you can make sure you don't waste your time when the inquiry isn't working. So is there a daily routine? Yes, do, do all the things that you're destined to do. And in your spare time, try as hard as possible to find out who you are and don't, um, don't give up. If it's not going very well, just find some 
suitable subject that, stop, that will stop your mind from running away. Next question. I've been reading Bhagavan's teachings for the past two years on the Kendra's WhatsApp group, but I've read no books on Bhagavan, nor on the Vedas or Puranas except the Bhagavad Gita. Recently, I have had an experience of a very powerful silence on hearing one of Bhagavan's devotees, Papaji, speak. Am I on the right path? Well, first of all, congratulations. You've been very lucky. Um, having a head full of book knowledge, you say, you, I don't know if you feel um, you've missed out on not reading all these books, but I don't, I don't think you have. Having a head full of book learning is often a handicap rather than a help. Uh, if you remember, Bhagavan only publicly certified two of his devotees as being self-realized, his mother and Lakshmi the cow. I don't think his mother was much of a scholar and Lakshmi definitely wasn't a big reader. They, they both managed very well without studying any of the scriptures. Uh, before I continue, I'll, I'll just throw in one little story, which I liked, which comes from Jay Krishnamurti. Um, many, many years ago, he said he would, he would love to sit next to someone on an aeroplane for 10 minutes, someone who didn't know who he was, and just talk to them about his ideas. He thought that such a person might get the experience because their head would be uncluttered by ideas, expect, expectations. He said, all the people I talk to regularly uh, have heads full of all the teachings I've given them over the year, ideas. He said, this conceptual structure is stuck inside their head and it prevents them from getting the experience that I'm talking about. So, Sometimes, especially when it comes to meetings with jnanis, newness and a complete lack of experience in the teachings can actually be an advantage. Um, the words that come off a liberated being can put you into silence, even via video, and even if the jnani is no longer still in the body. That there's a power in these words that transcends the medium, it transcends the physical existence of the jnani, there's a power in those words, and those words have the capacity to show you who you are. Um, your question is the second incident of this sort I've been told about in the last two or three weeks. It's something that seems to happen on a regular basis when people tune into these video satsangs. And what I will say is, if the words of Anyani land in the right place, they can put you into these intense states of intense silence and even give you an experience of the self. You don't need any preparation. You don't need to read any books. The only thing that you need to get that experience is a quiet, receptive mind. So since this is an experience you had watching a Papaji video, um, I'll just say that I, I lived with Papaji in the 1990s and I watched deep experiences happen regularly to the oddest people at the oddest of times. Uh, my favorite was a man who came into the satsang hall simply because he saw a big crowd there and wondered what the big crowd was doing in this hall, so he came in to find out. He just stood at the back, listened to Papaji talk for a few minutes, and then had a really deep, really profound experience of what, what appeared to be no self. It, it didn't last. But there, there's something about newness and freshness. He didn't know who we were. He didn't know anything about Papaji, Bhagavan, the teachings. But he was receptive. He had a mind that could listen. And he had a mind that could be dropped at the right moment when the, uh, when the words hit the right spot. Um, I, I started off this particular Q&A with um, the Upadesha Manjari quote about fitness and maturity. Um, to me, it seemed that a lot of people were getting these experiences without having done much practice, without having read the books. They didn't seem to have developed maturity in the, in the classic sense. So I once asked Papaji about this idea of spiritual maturity. I said, do devotees, are devotees more ready to have this kind of deep experience after a lot of preparatory practices, after study, after meditation? or are these preliminaries not necessary at all? To which he replied, if you are talking about maturity, the only distinction I recognize in devotees 
is between those who can listen attentively and those who can't. So having I, I talked to him many times about this. This is something I really love chatting to him about. And what he told me, or I, I will summarize what he told me. He said, if the words of Anyani land in an empty, silent mind without being thought about, considered, disputed, categorized or processed in any way, then they have the capacity to put the listener into the state that those words are pointing at. I saw this happen again and again in Lucknow. There were people with good intellects, uh, people who had read all the right books, the philosophy books, the Vedas, the Puranas you said you haven't read. They would sit there and they'd never had any kind of experience. And there were those who had a much emptier head that wasn't clogged up with concepts, knowledge and ideas. And they would often be the ones who got the experience. Um, your actual question uh, is, um, am I on the right path? And I would say, I, I think the fact that you had the experience means that you are. Look after, look after the silence and cultivate it by not putting attention anywhere else. If it comes again, stop whatever you're doing and make it welcome inside you. Uh, I, I will tell a nice little analogy since we're talking about Papaji, I'll tell a nice little analogy. Uh, he talked about Miss Peace. M Miss Peace is, com comes to visit you occasionally and you get some kind of premonition, some kind of inkling that she wants to come in uh, and take you over for a little bit. And he said, she's standing outside your door and you get a feeling that she's there. And the first thing you have to do is get out of the way. There, there isn't room inside you for both you and her. So symbolically, metaphorically, he said, you're, you're sitting on a chair in your room. So get off that chair, invite Miss Peace in and invite her to sit on the chair. That's to say, you, you get out of the way. You, you make yourself a nothingness in this process. You say, Miss Peace, sit, sit on your chair, sit, sit on your throne inside yourself, make yourself at home, be there. And he said, she will come in. She's a little bit shy, invite her in, show her full respect put her on the chair, and then absolutely keep your attention on her. He said, she's very shy. She won't come in unless you vacate the chair and make her very welcome. But once you put her on the chair, she gets distracted. She gets bored very easily. If you're not putting your full attention on her, she'll notice it and she'll get up and walk out. So the two stages are make, make her welcome, invite her in, get off the chair, get, get off your sense of being a person inside the body, allow Miss Peace to take you over. And then as she takes you over, as she takes you over, keep absolute full undivided attention on her because the moment your attention wavers and goes somewhere else, Miss Peace says goodbye and disappears. So the next question is, when one begins to stabilize in the self, does it hasten the passage of karma? I have two impressions. One is that it hastens karma and the individual must accept the consequences of karma over many lifetimes. The second is that karma disappears and has no real bearing anymore. Things just flow on a much easier, which is a truer impression. Uh, um, again, I'll, I'll keep this one a little bit short because I'm overrunning a little bit. I would say, uh, but I think Bhagavan would say that until there is a definitive moment of self-realization, karma will always be there. You don't diminish it by having good experiences. It just recedes into the background. If you have a glimpse of the self, karma may be suspended for a short time, but you, you haven't eliminated any of it. When individual identity resumes, karmic and karmic consequences come along with it. The unfortunate truth of the matter is, if you think you're a person who occupies a body, a person who makes choices and who plans for the future, then karma will stick to you and it will bring you back life after life. Um, you can have nice, pleasant states where, where, you, where you might feel a sense of union with the self, but you haven't eradicated karma. It's just kind of receded into the background a little bit. Sooner or later, it will come back and bite you again. If uh, the locus of identity is the self, if that's what you identify with, if you know yourself to be that self, if you've permanently ended the idea that you are an individual inside the body, then karma ends for good. 
there is no karma for those who fully and permanently know themselves to be the self. So I, I would say there's no gradual diminution of karmic effects. This question seems to apply there's a slow attenuation of karma and its effects, or maybe you don't notice them so much, or maybe they don't affect you so much. Apologies if I'm misreading that, but that's the implication I'm getting. I don't think that's the case. Karma is a very binary system. If you have an I thought and body identification, there will be karma and it will never end until that I thought goes. And if you don't have an I thought, there's no karma at all. Oh, here's a good question. Lots of good questions, by the way. I, I'm enjoying these. Uh, how do I know if I'm doing self-inquiry correctly? I try to focus on the I, but I cannot find the source of the I. I feel stuck. Are there any means by which I can know I'm doing the practice correctly and hence making progress? I think this is a question a lot of people are. Judging by my email inbox, this is a question that many people ask. Um, the instructions on how to do self-inquiry are very simple and they're fairly easy to put into effect. Um, the problem is, or this is my perception of it, people try the practice. Uh, they don't have any tangible results except sporadically. And then they come to the wrong conclusion that they're not doing it correctly. Um, if you are trying to be aware of the I thought, if you go back to it whenever you recollect that attention has strayed elsewhere, then you're doing it correctly. Don't judge yourself. Don't judge how well you're doing it by effects, results, and consequences. They're not the best way of judging whether you're doing it properly or whether you're making progress. As I said, I get lots of emails from people who think they're doing it wrong simply because they have expectations of what's going to happen when they practice. And when those expectations are not met, they think, oh, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it right. I'll write to David and find out what I'm doing wrong. You're not doing it wrong. If, if you're holding on to the eye as much as possible and going back to it when you get distracted, then you're doing it properly. Um, Self-inquiry is not a technique for instant gratification. That's not the way it works. It's not something that produces immediate results. Uh, although um, I, I will say that when people start the practice, they often have a honeymoon period where everything goes well for, for a while. I think that's possibly why they think after a few months when they, the globe has worn off and it's not doing so well, that they think, well, maybe I'm not doing it so well. I used to have good experiences, good states. Now they're not happening so often. I must be doing it wrongly or badly. That's, that's not correct. You, you, you get a kind of bit of a free bonus when you start to get lots of nice, happy states. And then after that, the hard work starts. And as I say, if, if you stick at the practice, uh, if you refuse to get distracted by other things, if you can keep your attention on the eye, then yes, you are doing it properly. Um, when, when people ask me this question, there's a, there's a standard quote by Bhagavan, which I often invoke. And Bhag somebody asked Bhagavan, uh, how can I tell if I'm making progress or not? And to which he replied, uh, to whatever extent one becomes free from thought, to that extent one can say one's making progress. Uh, that's, that's fine, except that, um, I think the vast majority of people uh, are not free from unwanted thoughts, so they don't have that particular litmus test to work out how well their practice is, is going. But that, that, there's, there's another way. There's, there's another way of uh, looking at this problem, if you like. Um, am I making progress? Am I doing it correctly? So I will ask a counter question. Do you care about self-inquiry to the extent that you want to do it more and more? Is, is it something that you feel drawn to? Do you have a passion towards it? Um, do you feel that self-inquiry is something that calls you on a regular basis? Do you, re do you really, really want to succeed at it? Do you want to attain liberation? Do you want to attain peace? Is this something that's really important in your life and it's something that you want to go for and accomplish? If, if you ticked any of those boxes, then um, you're, you're doing it well, because I think one sign of doing the practice properly 
is that you want to go back for more. It, it, it becomes addictive. You want to try harder and harder. Um, you're not satisfied with samsara. You want to get out of it. You have a passion to transcend, a, a desire to get beyond it all. And that's what takes you to inquiry. It, what, it's what takes you back to the I and art and the again and again. You might get the peace, you might get the happiness, but somewhere in there, I think you can evaluate your progress. You can evaluate whether you're doing it properly by how much you care about the practice and by how much time you're willing to put into it. Uh, a third aspect, I would say, uh, another way of looking at this question and a possible answer is don't doubt the teacher and don't doubt the teachings. Um, follow Bhagavan's teachings and have on inquiry and have faith that he knows what he's talking about. Why, why, why should he not know what he's talking about? He, he did this himself and he succeeded. Why should he tell you to do something that wasn't true, wasn't good, wasn't effective? Have faith that he's given you a good method and have faith that he's leading you in the right direction every time you take up the practice. I, I think this is something that's not stressed much, but I, I think this is something good to bear in mind. Accept that Bhagavan knows what he's doing and that when you sit down and say, who am I, or hold on to the I, then somehow you can see Bhagavan smiling. This, this is someone who's listened to my teachings this is someone who's trying to put them into practice, someone who wants to dissolve their eye in its source and realize the self, and the grace from the guru starts to flow. So you have, you have the faith, you have the conviction. Bhagavan knows what he's talking about. This is a good practice. This is a good method. When I sit down and ask myself, who am I? When I sit down and hold on to the eye, Bhagavan is there on my inside, looking at me, pulling me towards him. Have that faith, have that conviction. Um, if, if we follow his instructions, if we don't think about them, if we don't doubt them, then we end up in the right place. There's, there's one little story. I, I told this story about 10 years ago when somebody asked me a similar question. I'll, I'll throw it in as a concluding story because I think it shows how good it is to have faith in Bhagavan. It, it, it's a kitchen story. Um, it, 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 in the kitchen, there was a big pile of um, eggplant stalks. That's the, the end that you throw away with the spikes on. There's a stalk, and then there's a, a little kind of piece that holds the main, the main vegetable. Uh, these are not eaten, and at Ramanashram, not even the cows could be persuaded to eat them because of the spikes on the edges. And Bhagavan came into the kitchen one day and announced that... Uh, uh, he wanted to make a dish for everyone that day out of the eggplant stalks. So people didn't say, that's ridiculous, nobody eats these, even the cows won't eat them. There was one man, he said, yes, yes, Bhagavan. And Bhagavan said, put them all in that big pot, put some water on, simmer them, you know, put this in, put that, start stirring this, and I'll come back later. This man didn't think, this is going to taste terrible, or um, may, may, maybe uh, I should add something else to make it taste better. He knew his instruction was, stand by this pot with a stick and stir till Bhagavan gets back. So morning, the morning went on and uh, the water in the pot boiled away until there was just a kind of sticky residue in the bottom. And this, this devotee didn't abandon his post, he didn't think, um, this isn't going to work. He had faith. Bhagavan had said, stand there with the stick, stir this, I'll be back later. And at the last possible minute, Bhagavan wandered in, peered into the pot and said, oh, that looks great. Just add a little bit more water, to stir it up, and that will make a great dish. This particular dish was served to the people in the dining room. They, they all thought it was wonderful. They asked for seconds, and no one had the slightest idea what it was. Now, for me, the bottom line of this is that Bhagavan gave an instruction. He said, stand here with the stick, stir, I will be back later. So transfer that to self-inquiry. Uh, he's saying, hold on to your sense of I. That's all you have to do. If anything else arises in your mind, ignore it. Take your attention back to the I. I will be waiting for you, if you like, at the end when you, when you finish this process. 
So it's not up to us to say, this isn't working, maybe I can do better, maybe I'll tweak the method, maybe I'll find a slightly more advanced or evolved way of doing this. There's a very simple set of instructions. Bhagavan has given us these instructions. If we stick to the letter of what he said, if we have faith that he wants us to get back to the self as quickly, as efficiently as possible, he's not asking us to do odd, odd things that are going to take us off in the wrong direction. If we, if we have that faith, if we just hold on to that eye, refuse to be distracted, don't get involved in side issues such as evaluating what progress we're making, deciding whether we're doing it correctly or incorrectly. If we just stick literally to what he said, these are the instructions, I am now carrying them out, then the grace of Bhagavan will come. As, as with the kitchen story at the right moment, he will come along, he will stir it and say, that's it, you're cooked, you're finished. So thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Mr. Godman, uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving us your time.